Do we have any people wandering up yet, Jill, or do I need to get the puppets out? Another couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know the trick does. Quick. Um, does anyone feel like I'm Does anyone feel like saying to the room, Becky? <laughs> You're safe. The last session of the day, and I, I hope you found today really interesting and useful. I mean, there's been a lot of noise going on, so uh, hopefully you can network and we'll be talking about data. And GI, etc., and geography. So I'm joined on stage by four panel members. I've uh, got Claire, Nigel, Rachel, and Jenny. And the theme of uh, the discussion <coughs> is around transformation and um, how do we move towards being data driven? What does that mean for us? And how do we have to work together to actually meet our goals? So I'm now going to ask the panel to briefly introduce themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm Claire Moriarty, and I'm the Permanent Secretary of DEFRA. Nigel Griffiths, so we are the Chief Executive of Portland Survey. <laughs> so, my name is Rachel Mills, and I work at the University of Southampton, which is obviously in the city here. I'm the Dean of Natural and Environmental Sciences. I'm Jenny Tenson, I'm the CEO of the Open Data Institute, which is a not for profit based in London. <laughs> okay, so I'm now going to ask each of the uh, panel members um, a question, um, and then when we've been through the four questions, I'll open it up to the audience. So, while the panel members are uh, answering my question, if you can start to think of questions you'd like to ask. So, start with Rachel. Okay. Um, I'm interested in knowing how we can work with universities and research sectors play a more fundamental role in how government thinks differently about data in the future. So first of all, my expertise, I guess, I'll start with there, is that I'm an oceanographer and I go out on ships and I collect data from the deep ocean and then I try and work in interdisciplinary teams to bring together an understanding of seafloor habitats and mineral deposits on the seafloor, but out in the deep ocean basin. So I, I sort of work in the space we've been talking about today and I've had a fantastic day, actually, so thank you for inviting me. But to answer your question, um, I think there's two things we can do from the university and research se sector. So I represent both the University of Southampton and the National Oceanography Centre, which is a government institute that's based in Southampton on the same site as the University of Southampton down in Dockgate 4. And we can help you understand what data is out there, and we have a sort of global reach that I think <coughs> is particularly helpful. And um, I think we can help you understand how you can use that data in different ways to provide new information. And I really think we should be working much closer together between our students, our staff, and our research effort and the sector that I've been exposed to today. And then secondly, I think we can provide a confidential and an expert friendship, if you like, where we can, you can ask us questions in what I call a guilt-free way about anything you want, and we can have those confidential sort of conversations in a safe place, where you don't have to sort of embarrass yourself about your lack of knowledge, we don't have to embarrass ourselves about our lack of knowledge, and we can work together in a partnership in a new way. And I think I really would like to explore how we could do that. So for, I'll give you an example of what we're doing at the moment. So the university has set up a cross-disciplinary institute um, called the um, Environment and Sustainability <coughs> Institute. It's sort of embryonic at the moment. We haven't quite launched it yet. And the group in that institute are working with Southampton City Council to better identify places to monitor air quality in the city. We know there is an air quality issue in Southampton. We're developing sensors for monitoring air quality to put on the ground, to calibrate other measurements and to link in with satellite observations of air quality across the city and region. And then we're working with our big data institute and our medics to understand the impact of both that, sort of data, that information to allow us to make decisions about maybe how you get to work in the morning and where you, which route you take down the roads in Southampton or where you want to live, through to the um, health impacts on the community and the wider population. So this is really big and ambitious, but I think it's a new way of working, and it's a new way of working between, in partnership between the academics, the students, and the council um, locally. And I think we could take that model and we could um, extend it in many different ways. 
And then I think the other thing I wanted to say is we then tap, take that approach and tap into our global network. So we've been out in South Africa, we've been out in New Zealand, in Australia, and in Vancouver, taking that methodology and talking to the port cities in those countries about doing the same things globally. And I think that's where we could work effectively. A little bit more. Um, the other thing I wanted to hear from you guys was, I mean, we're very interested to know whether what we're offering in the university sector is still relevant for the modern um, data-driven um, environment sector. So are the master's programs that we're offering, is the CPD we're offering, are the massive open online courses that we offer, are the PhD cohorts we're developing, are they fit for purpose? And so I'd welcome any comments to me as the dean about whether what we are actually offering in our sector is relevant and keeping up to date with the massive pace of change that's happening out there. And this, this is a really timely time with the, the new industrial strategy and the funding that's coming out from that for us to adjust what we're doing in our sector to meet the needs of your sector. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now, uh, Deaf facing the challenge of transformation. How is data powering and energy have to be differently about data to keep to this? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to confess first, I know these chairs quite disconcerted. It's going to be backwards like that, so I have to sit like that or sit like that. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so it's, it's, it's lovely to be here today. I know an awful lot of planning has gone into uh, this, particularly the combination of the conference today and the unconference uh, tomorrow, and it's brilliant just to see so many people here. So, uh, transformation, interesting thing. We have a bit of a tendency to talk about transformation as if it's a thing uh, that we're going to do. Um, and I'm going to pitch you an alternative uh, idea, which is that transformation is the process of getting from where we are at the moment to where we want to be, when the destination is sufficiently different from the starting point, that the only way we can get there is by uh, starting the journey as if we were in the place we want to be. So not just, you're not, not kind of just doing what we have been doing and hoping we're going to get somewhere different. We've got to think differently from the start if we're going to make that journey. And the challenge that DEFRA has uh, certainly fits that definition of a sufficient di distance between the, the destination and the starting point. Um, we are trying to become more customer focused. Uh, we are trying to do things better and less. Uh, and we are needing to do a whole lot of things that we have never thought about before as we navigate uh, the challenge of EU exit. So I have three principles that are guiding the journey that we're going on. The first one is about being outcome focused. Um, you know, one really obvious uh, observation is that you know, most people who work in the DEFRA group uh, do that because we care about the outcomes that we are uh, working for, whether that's about the state of the natural environment, whether it's about how we protect communities against flooding, whether it's about how we make sure that uh, you know, we have food security and we can import and export food. It's outcomes to get people out there in the morning. So if we want to get somewhere different, we need to keep focusing on the outcomes and how we get there. The second thing is that we have to be open-minded all the time about how we're going to get there. So the thing that I keep coming back to is, is uh, whether we are optimising for outcomes or optimising for organisations. So if I'm an organisation or sitting in an organisation, I can say, oh look, here are these outcomes. I'm contributing to an outcome around the natural environment. My tendency is going to say, what's the, how can I best within my organisation do things to get to that outcome? And that will get us somewhere, and we will do things, you know, if we're constantly, as long as we're always asking the question about how do we do things better, we will get better. But actually, if we want to be best and do the best for our outcomes, we need to say, here's the outcome we're trying to get to. And if I look across all the people in all the organisations who have contributed to that, how can we best deploy ourselves uh, to get those outcomes? And then, what does that mean for individual organisations? So we, rather than saying the solution to how we change is going to be what does each organisation do a bit differently, the solution, we have to be prepared to look at broad solutions. Where we say, well, it might be, you know, it might be that this organisation does more of something and this organisation does less. Or this organisation stops doing it altogether because actually we can do it better in another way. So being as open-minded as we can about how we get to get to places. And the third thing that goes along with that is we, we need to avoid assuming that one size fits all. One of the things that I love about DEFRA, which is part of its challenge, is that is the variable geometry. So we have 30, I'm not sure if it's 33 or 34 or 35, uh, different organisations within the DEFRA group. Uh, they are all different, they have different mission and purpose, but they have also a huge number of different constitutional statuses. So we have 
you know, we have executive agencies and we have non-profit bodies and we have non-ministerial departments, lots of different organisations that work in different ways. So it's no good thinking that we're going to find one model and take it as a nice cookie cutter and go like that, like that, like that. We've got to come up with things which are quite uh, flexible. So those are my three principles. Uh, and the question is, how do data and empowering people uh, fit into that? So uh, data is absolutely integral to uh, transforming in the way that we need to change in order to get to our destination. So three quick examples. One, uh, if we want to be focused on outcomes, we need to know what the outcomes are, uh, we need to be able to measure them, and we need to be able to track our progress towards those outcomes. All of that is about data. Secondly, uh, the, the, there's, there are so many things that you can do with data, and that you know, will, I'm sure will be a lot of what we've been talking about today, which can actually be the, be the different way in which we do things. So remote sensing, uh, we can monitor in a different way, we can enforce in a different way, we can spot the opportunities, we can decide how to focus our effort by using uh, data. And we can also you know, make sure that we, can, we are zapping the right, you know, we can get a little tiny bit of pesticide and zap the right heat rather than that So data is a huge help to us in doing things differently and in becoming the organisation that we want to be. And thirdly, uh, data is critical to the way in which we serve our customers. So I spent quite a lot of time in March going around, sitting next to people, particularly in uh, the Royal Payments Agency and the Royal Clark Health Agency, getting them to show me what they did, sitting beside them while they took uh, calls from customers. And you know, the experience of our people in the organisation and our customers uh, is not great because our systems are so clunky. Uh, so you know, if you want to start keeping track of them, you bring up the RPA and they give you a county parish holding number. And then you, with your county parish holding number, you bring up the NPHA and they give you a herd number. And with your herd number, you then bring up the British Cattle Removal Service and say, I'm about to lose my cattle. Now, that is, a, that is data. Every single step of that involves data. The data is not being shared between the organisations, not because the organisations are lucky to share the data, but because their systems don't let them do. So we have to get smarter about how we use data in order to provide the best possible service. <coughs> so data is critical to making uh, to transform the way <coughs> But data doesn't do things on its own. Data doesn't get up in the morning and say, hey folks, let's innovate. It's people who get up in the morning and do that. And people will only do that if you, they, feel uh, that you're empowered, enabled, invited uh, to do that. So I might be able to ask people to do things. I might be able to think of some things and say, can you help me do this? Um, I've knocked around, maybe it's the government, uh, and I have it going, we used to do that in the NHS, could we do that over there? Or rail work better when we did that? How do we, how do we bring lessons from other sectors? And but in the immortal world of Taylor Swift, uh, you don't know what you don't know. And if we're going to, uh, if we're going to get most quickly to the place we want to be, that means people not waiting to be asked. Uh, it means people getting out of bed and going, you know what, we can do something differently. So you here today, uh, you as the deaf related community and uh, you know, people connected to that community, uh, you are able to use our precious asset of the data that we have. You have the knowledge and the connectivity to do great things with it. So my message to you is, uh, please feel empowered to do everything you can to help us to transform. Thank you, Paul. Just the mic. I bet you want to ask me a question. No, sure. <coughs> oh, sorry. It's been a long day. It's been a long night. Jenny, how can the changing role of ODI support government through this transformation journey? Um, so the Open Data Institute was set up in, in 2012 by uh, Nigel Shambolt and Tim Berners-Lee and we had a mission at that point to um, try to find the value of open data. I think what, one of the things that we've learned, we're about five years on from that, uh, one of the things that we've learned is that getting the value out of data goes much broader than open data. So what we're really concentrating on now is the question of how can we build a strong and fair and sustainable data economy. One that works for all different types of um, organisations and people in, in the economy. So. We believe that data is useful for making more informed decisions, for making better decisions, for making decisions faster, um, and that that ha happens for us as individuals, it happens in business, and it happens at, at government as well. 
So how can we get data to people who need it when they need to make those decisions so that they can make them faster, so that they can make them better? So building a strong, fair and sustainable data economy helps to, means, get, means that we have data getting to people who need it, and it means that we can underpin, we think, um, all of the different aspects of work that go on in an economy. It's not just about supporting, you know, trendy digital startups in Shoreditch who are making apps for iPhones, right? It's about uh, making everybody work better, whether it's in transport or it's in agriculture or it's in finance. So we're working um, across. Sorry. Do you want? Them? <laughs> um, so we're working across different kinds of data in order to do that. Obviously we still think that open data is really important for getting data to people who need it. If you can open data up um, so that uh, people can access it quickly and easily um, and it's available for everyone and they can then process it and they can then share it on. Um, we think that that's a very good way to get to a strong and fair and sustainable data economy. Um, but on the other hand, we also have to look at, for example, good access for individuals or organisations to data that is about them through secure but open APIs. And we also need to look at um, good and secure methods for researchers to get hold of data so that they can do great analyses that mean that we learn about the way the world works and so that we can function better. So all those, all those different types of access to data are really important. Just, just removing friction from access to data we think is essential for, for building a data economy that really works. Um, and as part of that, then we work across really uh, three main areas. Um, one is around building the right data infrastructure. For that, then we don't just mean getting the right data sets available and uh, usable by people, but also making sure the right governance pieces are in place, the right policy pieces are in place, that they're sustainable because they're funded in a good way, and so on. So, so we work uh, to, to help put the right policies in place, to have the right technologies in place to make that, uh, that infrastructure reliable uh, and easy to use. Second area where we work is around skills. So if we have an environment where everybody is um, getting access to data and being informed by data, we need to have skills to actually use that data. That isn't just <coughs> for us about data science skills, not just about whether or not you can you can analyse data once you've got it, but also basic data literacy pieces about knowing the power of data and the kind of role that it can have in society and, and within an organisation. And particularly for policy makers and business leaders, how they can use data as a tool to achieve their objectives. Um, so, for example, the stuff that Claire was talking about, about working together in different ways, for example, across government and private sector and communities, data can, be a, can play a really big and strong role, access to data can play a really strong role in working differently. But policymakers and business leaders need to understand how that process works, so we try and help, uh, help them to do it. And that's through a combination of kind of research and also training and workshops and that kind of thing. Um, and then the third area that we work on is around innovation and driving innovation. Um, so that we think that that happens best when you are focusing around a particular challenge, something quite concrete. Um, so we have programs of work where we, we set challenges, we try and um, uh, get many contributors to address those challenges and then uh, incubate uh, companies who are building products and services in order to um, get something that's sustainable and that can be used long term. Um, so those are three kind of pillars that we work around, infrastructure, skills and innovation. <laughs> the other place where we spend quite a lot of uh, our attention is around trust. Um, we think that if we don't have trust, if, if people don't have trust in the way that we are handling data, then we won't be able to take full advantage of data. And um, that means we think working in three particular areas. One is around equity of access in particular. So not just having 
uh, large monopolies having access to particular data that everybody could actually benefit from, for example. Um, second is around ethics, and that's particularly in the case of personal data, and making sure that there's ethical usage and that we're thinking about ethics when we're designing how we use data. And the third thing that we think is really important is having a conversation with people. Um, so that, it, so that um, you look at um, uh, things that have really undermined trust, like, for example, DeepMind's access to personal health records, and one of the big errors that they made was not, being, not communicating about it really early on. Um, so we think that talking about plans with data, talking about what you're doing, being open about what you're, you're doing with data and engaging in a conversation, two-way conversation, is really important for, for building trust. So um, to summarise, we work around infrastructure, skills and innovation, and throughout that, trying to build trust in particular through being more open. Thanks, Jenny. And we did actually in an earlier workshop start to talk about ethics. I think that's something we can maybe discuss further tomorrow. Someone would like to pitch that tomorrow morning. So, Nigel, uh, with OS developing its role as part of public sector data infrastructure, what opportunities are there for collaboration in the future? Um, so, thanks. And I'd like to answer this by talking about Curiosity, Train Spotting, and Charlie Watts. Uh, I think those hold the key to, uh, to our contribution to the future. Um, I think curiosity is something that we hold very dear, which is what's going to happen next. And hopefully you've seen some of that as you've been around the, the organisation, and seen some of the experimentation that's going on. And some of that's around content, you know, because that's kind of the lifeblood of what we do, uh, recording the content of Great Britain uh, and doing that in finer and finer detail greater and greater currency, uh, more and more accuracy. Um, and we're involved in a number of experiments. Um, some of those are with uh, entrepreneurs, innovators. I uh, see um, you know, at, the, at the back we've got uh, a representative from the, uh, the Geovation Hub. Uh, thank you very much for waiting. Um, and that's one area where we're, we're looking to experiment and just get a, a flavor of what's happening next. Um, the other areas we're, we're involved in are, are some of the, the funded experiments that are going on in places like Manchester, where we've got a, an Internet of Things demonstrator, where we, in a four kilometre square uh, patch, we've collected another 40,000 features, which are now being used as part of the Internet of Things experiment. So what, what is this thing? How will it be relevant to the public, to public sector, to private sector, to the citizen, to the entrepreneur in the future? So there's a, a, a great thirst and, and hunger to talk about well, what's the next generation of, of geography. And you know, as a geographer, I think that's a fantastic thing to be involved in. The other thing that we're looking at is um, how is that then consumed? So there's, you know, obviously people will unfold maps and hopefully do that for millennia to come. But there are other ways of, of consuming. And so we're playing with, you know, what about HoloLens? And what about virtual reality? What about augmented reality? How do we munge data sets together and make them more relevant to the consumer and more action, you know, action oriented, actionable? So we've got a number of experiments uh, going on there. But one of the, uh, the things that we've got to guard against uh, is being train spotters. And you know, just because it can be done, then does it mean that we have to do it? So making sure that everything we do is tied back to, as Claire was saying, an outcome, a relevance, a use case is where this community starts to come together. That our data only has value if it's in the hands of someone who's making value of it. You know, otherwise, it's, as I said this morning, it's, it's horrific to have stuff which is just sitting on the shelf. That's wasted taxpayers' money. So the more that we create stuff, the more intense we should make the, the use case lens or filter uh, through which we put it. And one of the, um, uh, the, the benefits we have of sitting where we sit as a human survey with some of the, the reputation we have uh, across the world is that we also get insights from across the world. So we work with other jurisdictions, so in Bahrain, in Dubai, in Singapore. There is a, a desire to work with us, so hopefully we can repatriate some of that learning back into Britain when they're looking at their problem sets uh, and start to kind of retread some of that learning for the benefit of uh, Great Britain's population. So I think the um, well, the thirst is there, the curiosity is there to help uh, across a myriad of different use cases. 
um, and the, the trick is you know, talk to us. You know, again, a little bit like Claire was saying, don't feel that you need to kind of suffer in silence. You know, if there's a, a geo dimension to this, then we're all ears and we're really fascinated by this because it might actually give us an excuse to go and mark up another bit of our train set. You know, that, that might be a good thing. But actually, it should deliver the benefit back into Britain. So where's Charlie Watts in all this? Um, well, if you, if you read, and I, I do recommend it, the, uh, the Keith Richards autobiography, you know, he, he talks about you know, the components of the Roman state, and of course you've got Mick Jagger who does his thing, uh, much to uh, Keith Richards' amusement, um, and then you've got what you know, Keith does. And he says, actually, underpinning all this, what you have is Keith Watts, no, sorry, uh, Charlie Watts. He just keeps the band together. And you know, we all go off and kind of on the stage and do our stuff, He's there just keeping the whole tempo going. And that's a bit like Geo. You know, we're there. Uh, we may not be the first thing to put on the page, but fundamentally try and think of a world without it. So I think work with us, and I think together we uh, make a, a far better noise and make a far better contribution. So that's shoehorning Charlie Watts into the, uh, into the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully what you've just heard is about lots of uh, interesting questions and I'd like to open up to the floor. If you can uh, say who you are and who the questions are. We've got some real mics. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a question for Claire. Um, focusing on outcomes is exactly what we need to do. Who's designing? where we should be taking the rural economy? Because it's partly economy, it's partly environment. What is the design that we're moving towards in terms of natural capital, in terms of how the rural economy is going to be supported to grow? Because that's the outcome that we're looking to move towards, and all of this data is designed to support that journey. Um, that's a very good question, uh, and it's an interesting time, of course, to ask it, because if anyone hasn't noticed, we're in the middle of an election campaign. Uh, and that's why we are doing this under a problem of not communicating. So, <laughs> this is as painful for me as it is for everybody else. So, and I think, I mean, it, it is a genuinely interesting question because there's a, there's a mix in anything of, uh, you know, the government of any one time will be saying, this is what we, this is how we want to do things, this is where we think we, what we want to go. And that, and that is, so, so in truth, um, once we have, you know, we've got past the election and we've got ministers and we've got a strategy uh, and way forward, we will be able to answer that question better. There is also, of course, a huge amount of kind of drumbeat activity which just goes on in any case. So the world doesn't stop um, because we have uh, an election campaign. One of the things that's preoccupying at the moment is um, EU exit, um, and you know, EU exit is a given in the landscape. Um, and so we know that it's something we need to do. But the precise, uh, the, the policy decisions which will shape exactly where we're going are matters for ministers. Um, so at the moment we're kind of, you know, we know that we need to think about, for example, um, the Common Agricultural Policy um, has, that is in the European set of policy, and that has in reality shaped quite a lot of the uh, work that uh, DEPRA and the DEPRA group, all of the organisations have done in the rural space. So there's a whole question about what is the future of farming and the widest possible sense uh, and what does that do for the rural economy. Um, I can articulate the questions at the moment. I, what I can't do is to say, and I know exactly what the answer is. So where is the design? The design is always a mixture of um, where the elected politicians um, believe we should be going, um, where other things are pushing us, and you know, the work that's done by groups of officials uh, to help uh, give practical reality to the direction of travel. But it's very much tied up with things that at the moment, uh, you know, and the answer to a lot of questions at the moment is <coughs> we'll have to go back to that. Thank you. Hello. Um, <laughs> my name is Daniel Hallam. I'm from the Marine Management Organisation, and this is to Rachel. <laughs> um, but I'm going to try and shoot more on in uh, some of the stuff that Nigel was saying, and also some of the stuff from uh, Mike and Rose's uh, Mike Rose at the book session earlier. Um, I would like to give you my perspective of the academic community, but it'd be interesting to see what your view is coming from the other side. Um, one of the frustrations I have is that the academic community 
has got a lot of intelligence, a lot of resource, doing a lot of really interesting stuff, but they don't very often come and talk to those who are managing and implementing. So they, a lot of time, academic community builds models, ideas, looks at causal relationships, um, brilliant systems for fixing problems, whether it's managing protected areas or better farming practices. But they can very rarely ring us up and go, so will this work in your world? Um, can you do this? I've got an idea, would this work for you? Those sorts of questions. And a lot of times we say, well, just talk to us and we'll help you out. We haven't got much resource, but we can always talk. Is that something you recognize, or do you see it as wise and the government coming to us? Because there's a lot of papers out there with a lot of good information, but we simply just don't have the time to read them. And it is, we can't spend the time doing the research on the research, you see what I mean? So I, I really recognize that, and that's really a challenge. And one of the reasons I'm here is that Mike actually was a student at the University of Southampton, and I was his tutor, and I always knew he'd go far. Um, but he came back to the university early this year, and we had this exact conversation. And I think that challenge is, is really timely. It is time for the university sector to get up and get out and communicate much better across that divide. So one of the ways we're trying to do this that I'm going to mention now is the public policy unit that we've just set up at Southampton. So Julie, who's waving her arms, um, the back there is representing that, we have a stand downstairs. We've set this unit up precisely to open up the door and to be the conduit between the academics that perhaps aren't the best at um, articulating the question. So the conduit will be through the public policy unit and we, we welcome that, that, that communication pathway through there and we're going to try better to actually reach out and do stuff that's relevant. So I think there's a lot of pressure. We all understand the external pressures are changing very quickly and we as a sector are going to have to change to be able to actually meet the expectations of the government and the wider political um, international framework as well. So we're going to have to work better across this divide with limited resources to get the job done. So watch this space and we will get better at it. I think we wanted a response from someone else. No, oh, no, 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 it was just, just uh, Mike talking about we need to talk. No, that's a good thing. No. <laughs> Hello, I'm John Murray, um, Geographic Data Science Lab at the University of Liverpool, so I'd like to follow up on that point if I may. Um, one of the things we've done at Liverpool is we're funded through the Data Science Initiative, the government's Data Science Initiative within the lab, and we've created, we're actually breaking down silos within the university. The Geographic Data Science Lab is a multidisciplinary team where people might, like myself, be seconded from industry. Um, as a visiting academic, um, we've got people from maths, we've got people from geography, so we've actually brought together a lot, because to deliver it, you've actually got to look, look at a lot of disciplines. So we've got high performance computing experts, because we need those. Geographic data is massive, we've got to handle it. We've got mathematicians, we've got geographers, um, we've, we've got um, psychology. All of these are so important, so I think it's, my own experience of a year in that environment has been great. We've actually had a clean, we've actually been very fortunate, we've had a, a clean slate. We've been able to make a unit from scratch and been able to design it. So we have a lot of industry collaboration, we've got good relationships with government departments, and we're actually doing real research. Uh, people like Sainsbury's, uh, we're doing some work for them with store locations, we're doing some work with Littlewoods, doing some work with some very big clients like those, uh, Core Credit we're working with, um, big household names, we're doing actually research. And it's two-way, that's the nice thing about it, because we actually get something back. Because I think it goes that the, the industry and government need to tell the universities what to focus on. Because it's also sometimes there's a bit of a headless chicken syndrome. There's all this research, but what's the point in it? So, so I just wanted to add my bit to that, and I totally agree with what you said. <coughs> Hello, uh, Phil Wyndham from Auden Survey. A question for Claire. Um, Claire, um, Auden Survey traditionally has had great relationships with um, geography people, and spatial people, <coughs> and data people, hence the guys in the room. 
We have sometimes in the past struggled to make real traction with senior policy makers or very senior staff in various Whitehall departments or agencies. I understand government is complicated and, and there are different organisations across Whitehall with different cultures, but do you have any insight as to how we could better engage with very senior people and uh, particularly policy makers? Is there a best practice? Is there an approach that they welcome? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the folk here from uh, the Liverpool group will know that one of my great delights in life is joining up with people and encouraging them to have conversations because it's from those conversations that you know, interesting ideas emerge. So um, certainly, you know, at a, a personal level, um, Know, presented with a problem like that, my brain is immediately going into so, so what is it we can do to make it to make it happen? There's a I mean, with any kind of conversation like this, part of the art of this is for both sides uh, to to want it to happen, for both sides to uh, to see what the benefit might be. So in a sense, if the problem has been getting traction with the policy people, then uh, the question I I would put back to you is what is it? Um, you know, if you're, what is it would make it attractive from a policy person's point of view to have this conversation? What is it that, it, that it enables people to do that they can't do otherwise? Because you know, everybody in through you know, everybody's busy, everybody feels that they can fill their life lifetimes over, and so uh, and, and we're all focused on the things that are, that are most uh, present to us. So you know, for a lot of policy people, it will be uh, you know, relatively. Uh, the combination of what's the short term things, and, but also what's important to the outcomes that I'm trying to achieve. So if you can, uh, if you can cast what it is you're trying to do in a way that helps a policy person see how it clicks into their outcomes, um, then that's the point at which it's more the, the conversation is more likely to to get traction. Uh, no, sometimes it does take just a bit of initiative for <coughs> someone, uh, you know near the top of an organisation to say, so you know, how do we just make this conversation happen? Um, and certainly, you know, if there's anything I could do to help bring some people together, um, sometimes just that the visible interest of somebody senior saying, I think this could be a good conversation is enough to get people in the room. And then they, when, once people, and my experience is when people start talking to each other, they almost always find there is some value, but it's, it's it's how do you create the trail of breadcrumbs that causes somebody to come away from what they're focusing on and realise that there might be uh, something in it for them. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, Andrew Newman from the Data Transformation Programme in DEF. Uh, I was really interested in what Jenny said about building a strong, fair, sustainable data economy. Um, beyond making our data open, which we're pretty good at in DEFRA, what else should we be doing to support that economy? So the two things that, that I, um, the, the two other types of access that I highlighted were having uh, open APIs for access to by individuals or organisations to data that is about them. And the reason, uh, and that was one, and the second one was about researchers having access to, to data, secure access to data. Just to focus on the first one, that helps the data economy because it means that those individuals and organizations can use third party data analysis tools or um, other kinds of products and services that, that pull data together from that you might be holding um, with other data that they, that they might have just about themselves. So it, it helps to drive the creation of those intermediaries as well as giving benefit to, to the individuals or organisations that, that have access to that data that, that you hold about them. So for example, um, if farmers could, if there was an open API for access to data that, farm, that was about farmers, and then you could grow a, a, a economy around the tools that help those farmers to, to, to work better. Um, but the pieces that, that I was, uh, was coming back to were, were building that data infrastructure, were, were having those skills and driving those skills up, um, so, so more training, um, more learning, more research that then gets shared around. Um, and also, I think, um, you know, it, it is the case that opening up data, um, sometimes innovation happens without you pushing it. Uh, but it is also the case that 
uh, stimulating some innovation can be a really effective way of actually getting data used and of, of, of uh, bringing, bringing out um, uh, new products, new services that help everybody and, and help to, to build small businesses or grow small businesses. So that would be another thing that, that I think that should be doing in order to stimulate that innovation, stimulate the economy. Yeah, so um, our experience, we've probably helped out with that, but uh, so we've been issuing open data since 2010, and uh, the, um, we have about 16 products, the last, of, of the, the last wave of which came out in, uh, in 2015, and there was this feeling of good, you know, they are really good data sets, you know, they are not second-hand data sets, they are derived from the good stuff you know, that's out there. Um, and that should be enough, shouldn't it? And so, well, no, because that in and of itself is not going to fuel um, innovation, is not going to fuel exploration. Um, so Chris Parker at the back, I'll reference again. Wave again, Chris. Oh. Yeah, there you are. That's the man. Um, in our duration uh, challenge that we've been running since 2009, yeah, 2009, um, there was a, another kind of iteration of that. We said, okay, so we run these challenges and we invite people to come in and really get stuck into a problem which has got a geospatial dimension. How about if that was a continual thing? And so, um, as I would imagine many of you know, we've got a geovation hub in Farringdon um, above the Future Cities catacol, which has now got 700 plus individual members um, and where real companies are now being created from germs of ideas using our data or using other people's data. And we don't really mind. You know, it's there for people to go and kick an idea into either existence or to death to say it's not going to work. Um, and we're putting some wrappers around that uh, in terms of you know, support from our staff. We've got nine supporting um, fellow sponsors uh, who are in there. And we can provide people with some really valuable support. So if you're an entrepreneur, I've got an idea, brilliant. I've got some energy, even better. I've got some coffee. Now I'm really cooking. Um, and I've got a desk and warmth and I've got data, fantastic. The worst thing is you then go and sell it for a pittance. Uh, so we've also got legal support in there from one of our sponsors. So it's trying to give people a support network to take it from an idea, connect it to some data, connect it to a use case, connect it to a properly structured business, put it in front and we run three times a year, we run the um, out of the hot houses. Is that about right, three or four? Two open calls on the program, two showcases. Yeah. And a so we run a showcase uh, you know, every six months or so where we invite three or four of these um, uh, nascent businesses to stand up in front of uh, VCs, angel investors, legal companies, and it's an audience a bit like this uh, in a hot and sweaty basement normally in, uh, in Farringdon, and it's great fun, uh, and it goes on for hours because people just won't stop talking, and it's really good because you get people being stress tested as to whether this is a good idea or whether it's just a fantasy. So it's got a long-winded way of agreeing with you that just putting the data out there is fantastic, but putting some supporting infrastructure like around that is, you, know, you can actually create some real sparks, um, which uh, we're learning from. You know, we're not doing this purely altruistically, we're learning from it as well. We've just got over five minutes, so we can through a few more questions. Uh, Tim Kendall, Deputy Scientific Advisors Office. Um, question for Nigel. I think you've alluded to it a bit over, over the course of the day, but what are you most excited about in terms of where geography is going in the next five, ten years? Good Lord, I'm the <laughs> most excited about um, I, I think the fact that it is going to be the, uh, the, the electricity which is going to allow so many of these things to happen. Um, so we heard a Perda, perda, perda. Um, we've just been through a general review, um, and someone may or may not have said during that process that you know, geospatial information is like a general purpose technology. So for those people who are economists in the audience, you're going, yeah, absolutely. For other people going, what does that mean? Um, I had to have it explained to me. So general purpose technology is, is like electricity. You know, it is something that is just in the air. It is essential to the functioning of a, a society. And I think that's where we are. Uh, and I think the ability to, that it's now democratized, uh, it is now familiar to people who can't follow that, uh, who wouldn't know how to pick it in the place. Um, it is being used pervasively, uh, but people are contributing to it, knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, interesting.
we've discussed. Um, I think all of that is, is just fantastically exciting as a geographer. Um, and, and seeing the value that can be uncorked from this um, is, is phenomenal. Uh, and also seeing jurisdictions beginning to put their arms around the opportunity. So you know, in New York, one of the first things that Bloomberg did was we need a, a data officer of the mayor. And the first thing they did was, in my hit list, the first thing you should do is geocode everything. Because then you can start joining up the fire department with the planning department, with the justice department. And the same in Manchester. And the same conversation with the, um, the leader of Manchester Council was, I've got all this stuff. How do I make sense of it? Well, I've got an answer. It's a golden thread. It's an XYZ team. You know, we can do stuff here. And magic starts to happen. So that, that's what's really exciting about it. Yeah, big thing for you. Very exciting. Hi, I'm Councilor from Agency. Uh, joint question for Claire and Jenny from different perspectives, sort of backtracking a bit. Do you think government bodies should be trying to skill up to do the latest cool things like big data and data science, or should we maybe be incubating that in research institutes and external groups that maybe are a bit better at doing it? That's <laughs> clues in the question. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't meant at all, wasn't it, by a um, I, I think that there's a, a need for a, a mixture. Um, I think it's important for, uh, for any data scientist to, um, or technologist to understand the domain in order to really get the most out of data. And I think that that's where there's a benefit for having those, those kinds of people in-house. But I also believe that you can get a lot more innovation going on um, and a lot more value out of data if it is more widely available so that others can do that kind of processing as well. Um, so, so I think it has to be a mix and I think that the, the other thing I would say and to reiterate what I, what I said earlier is that the skill that is really missing is knowing, um, knowing kind of theoretically what data can do, not necessarily knowing how to do it yourself. Right? And I think that that's the skill that is really needed within policy makers and within business leaders, right? It is, is, is knowing how to use data as a, as a tool, knowing where it's going to be really important to, to build those teams internally and where you, could, where you could, should be doing it externally as, as, as part of that decision. And, and, I, and I very much agree with that. Um, I think that you do need a mix. Uh, we're never going to. Uh, we're never going to be able to have you know, all the people who know all about this stuff. And as Jenny says, uh, there are all sorts of things about the environment outside government which make it possible to do a lot of things with a lot of different alternatives. But equally, if we had, if you put it on its head, say, suppose we had nobody um, who was you know, the next artist sitting in the government, it becomes another thing that, that people in government talk about without knowing anything about. And the, the quality of conversations we can have with people you know, inside governments uh, will help people to be able to ask the right questions and you know, create the space in which things can happen. So I think it's, you know, it shouldn't be something that we think you know, we've got our arms around and we do it all ourselves, but equally, I think having some people who do know what they're talking about, um, and but also, really, really importantly, having the right links so that you know, the right people are listening to people. David's doing lots of sign language, aren't <laughs> <laughs> Time for just one more question. I think I'm in, in the queue. I'm uh, Bill Walworth from Swirl. Um, I don't want to answer this question because I think any of the panel would have interesting things to say on it. We've talked a few times about the value of um, interdisciplinary working and pulling data and knowledge from different places together to tackle any of the really interesting or, or difficult problems that face us. How do we scale that up when the time of the experts is so limited? How can we amplify the, the power of that disciplinary working? Interpret that data. A lot of innovations 
come around, come about because you take bits of, of knowledge that already exist in, in different fields and you stick them together and, and you look at something new. That's always difficult because I don't understand that other person's field. I don't know what exists. Uh, you know, I, I can Google it, but I won't understand what I find. Uh, it, it really can work if you get people from different fields that sit together in a room and work together for a year on it. And that's fantastic, but that's really expensive, and we have a lot of problems to solve. Other things that we can do around um, the way that we work with data, um, the you know, the way that um, I suppose government are really trying to get more you know, banks for a buck, trying to get more you know, banks for a buck, actually just kind of automate bits that can be automated, or um, bits that can be automated, or you know, speed dating for for experts. I mean, how, how do we work? How do we get more of that happening? We all think it's a good idea. It doesn't work very much. We all think it's a good idea. It doesn't work very much. So let me try and give you a one sentence answer. So let me try and give you a one sentence answer. I do think the answer to the answer is just say to more kind of evidence. The answer is just that the more people, the more likely it is that we're going to spark. Taxis, there is a drinks reception downstairs in the multifunction room. 